today we're looking at one of my favorite topics and that's writing bass lines. <laughs> And specifically, how to go from writing basic bass lines, where you're just kind of putting root notes under chords, to writing more interesting stuff that moves around, supports the groove, is syncopated, and all that kind of jazz. By the end of the video, you'll have an understanding of what makes a killer bass line, and then kind of how to go about a logical process of creating that in your own music, whatever the style may be, because these principles are quite universal and can be applied in many different ways. And the examples I have today uh, span a variety of different sounds and tempos and styles, so we'll be able to look at a few different applications of the material. The most important thing you can do to improve your bass lines, which is listen to bass lines. You need to listen to bass lines in the music that you love, in all music, and particularly it's very, very helpful to listen to and watch bass players on YouTube, or for your friends if they know how to play bass. I've spent so much time on YouTube watching bass players just playing live, playing at home, teaching, you know, whatever it happens to be, because these are the people who've spent their life playing the instrument. They live bass. They are bass. It starts to get your ears trained on that aspect of the music where you might have been more trained on melody, chords, drums even in the past, but getting the bass sound into you in an intuitive way kind of almost subliminal way is very important. And as you're listening and watching, trying to sing back what they're doing. You don't need to be so accurate in terms of pitch. You just need to get the vibe, right? You need to understand doom da doom 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 da doom 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 da doom da doom da this kind of thing. You just want to be able to sing the vibe, the feel of the bass for a particular genre or groove and you do that by listening and imitating just like speech. The more that you can do that, the better your bass lines will be because that's where the whole feel comes from. Even if you understand all these principles very in depth and your your you know A level on the theory side of things, if you don't have the feel, which comes through listening, then your bass lines are still gonna fall flat. So that's why I put this first. It's the most important point. Don't skimp on it. We're gonna look at the principles, of course, in these examples, which is very important, but listening is even more important. Please listen to bass. I've chosen something relatively simple compared to the others that is just exemplifying some basic principles we need to talk about before we get into the more complex stuff. And for all of the examples, I have the bass instrument boosted in volume compared to how I would normal, normally have it in a mix, so we can hear it more clearly. As well, for each of these examples, we're gonna look at three main areas, which is tone, note choice, and groove. These are the main areas you need to be focusing on when writing bass lines. Tone having to do with the actual sound of the instrument. Note choice having to do with what notes you're actually playing, the chords that are playing over you and how you relate to them. And then groove being how you interface with the drums and the tempo and the rhythm of the song and syncopation and so on. So we're gonna look at all of these in turn for this example and the others. So let's dive into this first one. So taking a look at this line, first of all, the tone. It's kind of rounded and soft and it fades into a dark state quite quickly and the whole thing fades out relatively quickly. When we listen to the track, we know it needs to be relaxed and chill. The whole track is that way. So the bass sound is chosen to fit that vibe and in particular, it's chosen to fit the length of the longest notes that we're playing. So we have these notes, you know, on each of the roots here that's fairly long, a few beats each, and the sound is designed to fade within the length of that, of these longest notes, so that our sound fits the rhythm of the song, fits the tempo of the song. So you get this satisfying full closure of each note and then 
reigniting it basically, right? So. That's the idea with the tone here. Now for the note choice, of course you can see the chords along the top there. This is in the key of C major, and this is an eight bar chord progression running through a series of chords here, a cycle of force progression. And we're gonna just be hitting roots mainly on strong beats. Now there's obviously other notes going on here too. And this is where we get into the topic of what other notes do you add when you wanna add some more interest to your line. Now in this first one here, we've got root, fifth, root up to the octave here, down to the third of the chord. And this third of the C major, E, happens to be a half step below the next target note we have. So this is an important point, which is that we're not just randomly jumping to the root note of each chord, we're trying to find interesting and smooth ways to get into it. So here we're kind of walking up root fifth root, dropping down to this third, which is smoothly walking into the F here. While we're on the F, we're alternating between its root and its seventh, which is the next lowest tone available to us and back to the root again, just to provide more interest instead of just going dun, da dun, dun, do dun, we wanna drop down and come back up. The idea is just moving away and coming back, right? So here, we're leaping up from the root to the fifth of the chord, which happens to be a half step above the next chord we're trying to go to. Same principle we did here. Again, we're going seventh back and forth, leaping down to the third of this chord, the B minor chord, B minor seven flat five chord, which is a D, which is right below our next root note. So you're starting to get the picture here. We're finding ways to create interest while the chord is being held, which is the back and forth with the seventh. That's a very common move. And then we're finding ways to transition to the next chord, which in this case, we are jumping to chord tones of the current chord, which are closest to the root note of the next chord. Here we've got a little um, kind of two note run. This little ghost note here, grace note, is causing the bass to slide. So this is the root sliding up to the fifth, down to its third, and then landing on the A here. So here we're doing a kind of like enclosure, as we say, where we're going above the target, below the target, hitting the target. Here we're walking down from A minor towards D. You don't always have to just rely on arpeggios. You don't always have to just play the root, the third and the fifth or the seventh of the chord. You can actually walk within the scale, right? When it makes sense. You wanna hit uh, important beats with strong tones, you know, preferably a root, if not a fifth, if not a third. But in between, especially in transitionary moments, you can use tones that come from not the scale of the chord that you're currently on, but the scale of the of the key that you're in. So we're in C major here. We're just taking the A and just walking a few notes. You could think of them as arpeggio notes, or you can just think of them as scale tones that tend towards the D down here. So here we're just having the D with the same motion down to its seventh and back. The G is walking up towards its fifth here, down to its third, and then onto a target note. What's going on here at this last bar is that this chord is being split between C major seven and C seven because the C seven is gonna lead us into F major seven. So the point is that the C seven is not diatonic to the key of C major. C major seven is diatonic, but C seven is not. The difference being that C major seven has a B in it and C seven has a B flat. So when we're doing our run, we need to respect that. So for the first half, we're just holding a root. The second half, what's going on here, we're sliding up to the third of the chord. This is the second sliding to the third, down to the second or the ninth, leaping down to the fifth. Then we're going up to this flat seventh that I just talked about, the B flat. And then we're walking down the key or arpeggio in a way. So this is the flat seven, this is the sixth, this is the fifth, leaping over our target note, which is the F, down to the third of C, and then landing on our target note. I'm hitting 
important notes, that is chord tones, on strong beats, like the third here is on the first beat of the run, the major third. And the other ones are formed by respecting the current chord, which is C7. So we're doing another kind of enclosure type thing, G, E, F, like this. So how I go about creating the contour of a little run like that is just by singing it. And I don't actually know what notes I'm gonna play yet. You know, I unfortunately don't have that ability a lot of the time. I end up just going and I don't know really what those notes are gonna be and I figure it out later. The idea is that I get a contour, a melodic contour in mind that feels good. I know that when I hit that C thum, that's what I wanna hear. So once I've got that, I start thinking what notes are gonna fit that and that's how I end up with this, thinking again about the current chord and where I wanna go. It all combines to create uh, this little fill right here. The most important thing when thinking about creating groove with bass is the drums. We gotta think about A, how busy do we want the bass groove to be? The more busy, the more tension and room it's gonna take in the song. The more it's gonna take the listener's focus and the more space it's gonna be taking up by changing notes all the time, not leaving space for other things to happen. So we have to determine that, how simple, how complex, and also what are the drums doing? So that the drums and the bass are gonna to work together like a kind of machine where the drums work almost as switches that can turn on and off notes or cause notes to change or interface with the notes in certain ways. There's lots of possibilities here, but this is just one way of looking at it. So what I've done is I've layered the uh, kick drums. I've just copied them, copied them into this track and muted them down here. And then we're gonna listen now through and look at the way that these notes relate to when the kicks hit. Now the kick drum pattern here is very, very simple, but let's take a listen. So you can see when kicks hit, something is happening in the bass because the kick drum, a low element, the bass, a low element, you want them to do this kind of boom, boom, boom thing where they're, they sound like a unified whole, basically. The snare can play a part in it as well. The snare can be used to say, turn off or turn on notes too. In this case, that doesn't happen as often, although it will happen more in other examples but it's a personal choice depending on the tempo and the groove and the feel you're going for. The point being that when you're creating these grooves, you're not just creating them in isolation, you're creating them to, to serve the whole composition. Am I working with the drums or am I fighting against the drums? If the kick pattern is trying to do a particular thing and the bass pattern is doing a totally different thing, you don't get this unified feel. So either the kick and snare have to give and match the bass or vice versa. So that's it for the first example. Quite simple, so we can move on to the next example.